Welcome to the Professional Book Nerds podcast presented by Overdrive. Before we get into today's episode, remember to rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Those ratings really mean a lot to us, and they help us get seen by more folks just like you. You can follow us on socials. We're at ProBookNerds on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And you can email ProfessionalBookNerds at Overdrive.com. My guest today, Madeline Pendleton, is the CEO and founder of Tunnel Vision, an LA-based clothing company with a progressive, employee-centered approach to business. In addition to her entrepreneurial success, Madeline has garnered a massive following on TikTok, where she shares stories and advice based on her experience growing up in California's punk scene, escaping poverty, and building a community-minded company. Madeline's book, I Survived Capitalism and All I Got Was This Lousy T-Shirt, is out January 16th from Penguin Random House. Madeline, hi, welcome. Hello, I'm so happy to be here. Oh, thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. And on a Friday, no less, of, of course, when we're recording. I'm... <laughs> yes. Well, you know, we have the four-day work week at my job, so wow. it's my wow. day off. <laughs> how, could, how could I forget? Because I am so entrenched in the five-day work week that I'm like, that can't be a real thing. <laughs> it is. One of many great things about uh, starting a company, I guess, is that you get to do it your way. To get us started... Could you tell the listeners a bit about I Survived Capitalism and all I got was this lousy t-shirt? Yeah. So this book is technically a memoir. It is a book about my life, which is interesting because um, I think my life is pretty boring, but maybe that's just because I lived it. So I'm like, who would want to hear about my life? Um, But every single chapter of the book is a different experience in my life, kind of in chronological order. And along with it comes a lesson I learned about money along the way. So the goal of the book was kind of to write a book about money in a way that would resonate, I guess, with younger people, um, because I found that a lot of financial literacy and a lot of finance tips in general were written by people much older than me, who I say this in the book, but seem to live in a world that didn't exist anymore. So the thing that really got me, the thing that set me off when I was trying to learn how money worked and how I was supposed to be a good adult was seeing everybody recommend, for example, that you're only supposed to spend 25% of your income on housing every month. And this is like <laughs> so funny to anybody who's rented an apartment in the last 10 years. You're right. Like, in what world can you do that anymore? <laughs> no, you would have to be making like $200,000 a year for this to be a reality. So yeah, the kind of the elevator pitch I always tell people is like, oh, I didn't want to write a book about money. I wanted to read a book about money, but the book I wanted didn't exist. So here we go. I wrote this. Your writing is so beautiful and so moving. It's earnest and honest. And it is it is your life, but it is such a good way to also learn by experience. How did you decide to write in this format? Kind of like starting with a memoir, but including the tips. Well, I think that one of the things... Um, that people seem to be super interested in when they learn about me is how my business that I ultimately started, spoiler alert, (laughs) as you get through the book, (laughs) how it runs. And it does run in a really unique way. And when people start asking me questions about the business and they hear things about it, like, for example, everybody who works at the business earns the same pay, or we have the four-day work week, the 28 hours is our full-time work week at the office now. And the unlimited PTO. Yeah, the unlimited PTO. That's true. Uh, And it's pretty funny because people are like, how do you administer that? And I'm like, oh, don't worry. If you upset somebody in the office, they'll just let you know. (laughs) It's a very circular (laughs) accountability type of situation. But no, people hear about this really unique office. And then I think inevitably the next thing they want to do is learn more about me. Like, who am I? What kind of a person am I that I wanted to run a business this way? And I have found that like when people learn about my work, they have questions about my childhood, about my upbringing, because they're looking for ways to make sense of how this business came to be. So I think that that line of questioning inevitably led to the book being formatted as a memoir, but, you know, a memoir with a purpose. And the purpose is to talk about not just my relationship with money, but I think a lot of people in our age range, our relationship with money. And I, that's what I tell people. There's nothing special about my life. The business might be a little special, but me, my upbringing, who I am, nothing special. And I think that that is precisely why the book is formatted the way it is. So you can see elements of yourself in my story because it is a very common story. It also just really helps to level set almost to take us all to that point of like, We're all coming from different perspectives, but we relate in so many places. And right while you do have this like 
unimaginable business to so many people who are in finance. And, you know, I mean, the first time I saw one of your videos on TikTok, I was like, yes, that that makes sense. The CEO is making the same amount as everyone else. And wow, everyone's happy and it works. But right, you immediately want to know more and how you got there. And so much of that seems to have come from the punk scene that you were involved in. Uh, how would you say that it shaped and modeled kind of your early life and then your mindset that drove you to where you are today? Well, I think obviously so much about punk rock is political and so much about business is political. And when you really look at like the political structures that uh, kind of drive counterculture movements, it is a drive for fairness, justice, equity, equality, all of these things. And those are inherently political concepts. And the way that we see these ideas of justice and fairness and equality kind of manifest in tangible ways politically for most people is in their workplace. This idea that your workplace is what sets up your relationship with finances, your ability to access resources. And this is where we see things like income inequality, wealth inequality for the owner of your company, which is different than income inequality, right? Because those people usually don't work for an income. They own appreciating assets that go up in value. You're working for an income. So I think the workplace really is like a microcosm of a lot of our political frustrations. And growing up in punk rock, you know, you're listening to bands like Crass, and this is a spoiler alert for the end of the book, say, do they owe us a living? Of course they do. Of course they do. And these things are all so tied to each other. When I bought my first zines at punk shows, they were all talking about anarcho-syndicalism, which is workplace structuring. So I think that like politics, yes, has always been the driving force of, of punk rock. And I think that Business and work has always been the driving force of politics. And learning how to navigate and survive in the world with, with both of those, it's a, it's a helpful place to start from, I think, at least to have information at your fingertips in a way that, uh, in, in kind of less of a, a packaged and sold way. It's just like a, hey, man, this is what I think, and I'm handing it to you in this zine. It's, it's a little different than maybe Susie Orman on 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 the TV talking finances. Yes, and you can access a lot of different uh, counterculture radical theories too. Now with the start of the book, uh, you start off with such, I mean, I was hooked immediately in what I would imagine was maybe one of the worst moments of your life with the story of, of your partner's suicide and looking at grief and money trouble and how this all leads together. How do you open yourself up to share that? I think that when, um, you know, my partner first committed suicide, it was very, very difficult for me to understand what I was experiencing. Uh, Western culture, I don't think, talks about death very candidly. It is treated as something that's very taboo or personal. And I actually was desperate to find somebody else to talk about death with. I wanted to talk to somebody who could relate to my grief. I was reaching out to people I barely knew who I had just heard had lost a loved one to suicide. I just wanted someone to talk to. And, uh, you know, I found that those conversations were the most helpful ones for me to kind of process what I was experiencing. And one of the things I did early on just in processing the grief of the loss of this person I was so, so, so in love with that I thought I'd be with forever is I just started posting about how I was feeling on the internet um, because I didn't see people do that very often. And it was cathartic for me, but I think in my head, it was also a way to normalize these conversations so that somebody else in the future who is in my position, maybe they didn't even realize when they were reading what I was saying that it was for them later. Right. And I have, in the years since his death, I had many people reach out to me online and tell me, you know, I just lost a partner to suicide and I don't know who to talk to, but I remembered you went through this. And whenever I see those messages, I do take the time, no matter what's going on, to sit down and talk with them for an hour, two hours, whatever I can, because a few people did that for me. And it was so, so helpful because those conversations are so sorely lacking in society the way it's structured today. So me opening up, you know, about that experience and that grief. Uh, it feels like there was no choice not to. It feels like a conversation people need to be having. And it was both good for me. And I think it is like socially good, good for other people to see and we can confront this. And, you know, there's also an element of like a gender politics in there 
my partner who died was a middle-aged man and middle-aged men are the highest risk group for suicide. And we don't talk about that. We don't talk about what patriarchy is doing to men as well, as much as we should. And seeing that, you know, I grew up a little punk rock feminist my whole life. And I was like, this is an issue of patriarchy too. This is an issue of gender-based violence too. This is what patriarchy does to men in our lives, the men we care about. Did you ever find yourself just while writing in general, because there's so much personal that you share throughout the course of, you know, your life story here. What were you doing for self-care or a way to process after writing? It was really hard. I mean, uh, very, very emotional. When I recorded the audiobook, I burst into tears a couple times and that was very challenging. Um, I think the, uh, my, instinct, and this is probably like a personality trait, my instinct is to always think that whatever I'm remembering, when I put it on the paper and I read it back, I'm like, well, it sounds so bad. I don't think it was actually that bad. You know, maybe, maybe I'm over-exaggerating it. Maybe I'm remembering wrong. There's no way I actually like went through all this and it's as bad as I remembered. So for me, a big part of self-care really was checking with other people to try to validate as much of my perceptions as I could. Like, did this actually happen the way I think it did? Like, is this how I remember it occurring? And in that way, it was like pretty helpful for me because it kind of validated my experiences. And you know, I think a lot of what you go through when you're young or when you're struggling, you just kind of push to the back of your head sometimes. You're like, oh, I'll get around to dealing with that. I'll get around to, <laughs> to remembering that. I'll think about this yeah. later. And then when we, I started writing the book, it's like, well, later's now. Like, this is, now's the time. I got to deal with this. I got to talk about it. I got to think about it. And I think it, it did make me closer with some people in my peer group, people I've known for a long time. Uh, you know, at one point I had to check in with my aunt and uncle and be like, I have this memory that I was trying to get emancipated because my relationship with my mother was so bad and I wanted to support myself. I have this memory of asking you if I could live with you. Did that happen? And to hear them say, yes, that did happen. And we seriously considered it. I'm like, okay, I didn't make this up. Like I was 15, 16 years old trying to secure my own housing and become legally emancipated. And that's something that maybe if I hadn't had to write about it in a book, I would have just kind of you know, forgot even happened. So for me, that validation was a process of self-care, I guess. No, and and that is such a good way to kind of look at look at our time in life, exactly what you said with later is now, because it, it doesn't really matter when it happened, later is still now. Yeah. But right, that idea of later is now and processing through and experiencing these things validating your own life experience did you find that others remembered things differently than you did or were you always just questioning it never seemed that bad to me or it's worse than I thought so I think it's worse than I thought is kind of a theme of the book you know when I grew up I thought I grew up middle class and then I met actually middle class people and I was like what um (laughs) You know, I thought that my family had it pretty together. And then I got old enough to learn the ins and outs of the adult financial conversations in the room and realized we did not have it really together. You know, hearing at one point in the book, I discussed learning that my family received a lot of charity from their peer group, which I had no idea was happening. Um, So, you know, I definitely did learn a lot of what I thought my life was like. It was it was a little worse than that. And I think that is a common theme for a lot of people who grow up maybe lower class, lower middle class. And I talk about this in the book, this idea that we've mythologized poverty to the extent that we don't see when we're in it. You know, I have friends who are like, hey, I'm sleeping in my car right now. And I'm like, you're homeless. And they're like, no, I'm just sleeping in my car right now. And I'm like, yes, my friend, that is called being homeless. Yes. Right. I That that section specifically, when you were talking about the the class distinctions that we we kind of put ourselves in without knowing anything else, and the homelessness bit just really hit me. The idea of, right, if you are that kind of invisible where you have a family or a friend to stay with for a few nights, but you don't know where you're going to go next, or you have a car to sleep and you're still homeless, or the idea of if everyone around you is a- about the same and you know there's a rich part of town, you don't necessarily realize that you're in the poor part of town sometimes. Exactly. Like that's something I had the experience of. And I say in the book, um, 
you know, this goes along with this idea of people validating your experiences. Talking about my family is hard because most of my family is still alive. And I know that there will be things they remember differently. I know that I was a child and my memory might not sync up exactly with theirs. I say in the book, even when I talk about realizing that I grew up poor, that I can hear my mom's voice already in my head saying, oh, Madeline, don't be so dramatic, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> and and I think that's a hard thing to reconcile. And it's an element of pride, right? Um, you know, nobody wants to hear their child go out into the world and say, hey, my childhood was a little difficult. And my parents did a great job of making sure, my dad in particular did a great job of making sure I had fun. You know, my dad was a 20-year-old punk dude when I was born. And to think that guy wasn't broke, you, you know, yeah, he was struggling, but we had a good time. We had a great time and he was a great parent. So there is this really difficult thing where, you know, I talked to him about it and I said, I'm worried that how I remember things might not be hundred percent accurate. And he told me, you know, if anybody write, remembers it differently, they can write their own book. <laughs> and that made me feel good because he's like, yeah, all of our experiences are tangible and real, but memory is plastic and elastic and our memories, you just do the best you can. And that I really struggled with. I even wanted to put a disclaimer at the beginning of the book. Like, this is just how I remember it. It might not be right. And my publisher had to be like, that is writing a memoir. Everybody goes into <laughs> it knowing this is your story and nobody expects your brain to be a video camera. Right. It is not a perfect representation of everything you're quoting. It's, it's not like that. No, especially not when you're a kid. And I'm like, I think this was happening. Is that what was going on? So it was actually very hard for me uh, to just to get in that state of mind where it's like, no, it's your story and your story is valid, even if somebody else remembered it slightly different or, you know, that, that was a big struggle for me personally, especially because right now my mother and I don't talk. We have a very, very difficult relationship and I was able to run things by old friends and family members, my dad, but anything involving her, it's, I can't check in with her. I can't, so uh, it's it's a weird experience. Um, and that is my biggest fear. Actually, my biggest fear is that I write this book and somebody's going to come out and be like, you remember this totally wrong. And then I, I get mad at myself. And then I have to remember like, well, I was seven. So <laughs> Right. You yeah. were seven and you didn't know that your life was different from anyone else's because it was your life. I mean, when I look back on memories, I now know as an adult and the stories I've heard since then, well, yeah, times were hard then. But in my life, it was my parents were just making everything fun and happy and we were having a good time. We didn't know, you know, if dad had taken a pay cut or, you know, if they were worried about how they were going to pay a bill one month. Like it was just, it was business as usual. It was us as kids having a good time. And sometimes, it, you know, I'm really grateful I had that growing up. And there's the times now where I'm like, well, as an adult, I see why they made the choices they made. And I'm I'm great, I'm still grateful that they did, but wow, I'm learning now. Yes. No, that's totally true. I think um being this is something I talk about too, where it's just this idea that like I'm in my 30s now, and I feel like I am in my 30s in such a different way that my parents the way they were in their 30s. And a lot of it, we talk about the stunting of millennials and Gen Z because our financial realities have made it so that it is more difficult for us to achieve those very standard milestones, things like purchasing a home, uh, having a family. So, you know, looking at it through that lens, when I think back and I'm like, well, my dad was in his 20s when he was trying to do this for me. And I didn't feel like an adult capable of having real financial conversations until I was at least a decade older than that. That is for sure the reality. I mean, I, there are times I'm like, do I know how to do my taxes? Does, <laughs> right. <laughs> will I ever know how to do my taxes? And then I'm like, mom, what do I do? How do I file this? And she's like, just use the program online. It's free. And, okay, okay, <laughs> fine. I think of now just like, I don't know if I could have navigated it that young. Like I, when I graduated college, it was like, okay, will I ever get hired? And there again, the your conversations about college and the, the collegiate system being a bit broken. I mean, sold depending on where you're at. I mean, you have very compelling conversations about how in your high school it was military. There was, you can go and you can serve and even the warning you got and of just like, oh, don't worry, we'll use you for strategy. You won't be on the lines. I mean, like that is is a jarring experience. And it you had a much more jarring one than that as far as the the, the bloody drives and the the awful yeah. <laughs> having your car broken into monthly in San Francisco. Right. 
Yeah. I mean, I think like for me, because my family didn't go to college, I think a lot of people like me who, who did well in school, didn't have a family background and academia, you know, we think that like just getting the college degree is going to save us. And that's what we're told. And that's what we're sold. Literally, we are sold a college degree. I feel like I was very preyed on by for-profit colleges who specifically target kids whose parents didn't get a degree. And when you look at that and you're like, well, I thought just getting this piece of paper was going to change my life. And you realize that it doesn't. And there's so much more to how college works. Like you need to be calculating an ROI, a return on investment for your college degree. And I didn't know what that, I didn't know what return on investment meant when I was 16 and graduated from high school. I, there's no, what nobody explained that to me. And, you know, all of these things that we like realize now in retrospect happened to us in regards to predatory kind of educational practices. I think there has been in recent years some effort to mitigate that, slightly more conversation happening around it, especially the for-profit college situation. But I don't think that the uh, not-for-profit colleges are faring much better for people unless they come out with like an engineering degree. And what I really found is that I had a lot of friends who went to college for English degrees, English lit degrees, and all of them got jobs doing administrative assistant work, making $35,000 a year that didn't even, you know, require the degree. They didn't utilize the degree. And when you look at it, I'm like, okay, you went to a, a, a private fancy school to get your English literature degree. It cost you six figures. And now you make 35K a year. That's hard. That's rough that's a challenge for people. And, you know, I think that you can be smart, but if you don't know what you don't know, how are you able to make informed decisions? Unless you happen to have a parent who's like, Hey, I've been down this route. Let me guide you because nobody else is guiding you with this info. And that's a hard lesson I learned. And it's difficult because I do, you know, I got my degree in fashion design and I work in fashion design and I do use my degree, but I'm one of the lucky ones. A lot of people from my college in particular, graduated with six figures of student loan debt, moved back in with their parents and got jobs, you know, working in insurance call centers. And, you know, that's, that's a very, that's like a challenge to the mainstream narrative that we're taught about just get the degree and you'll be fine. Right. When I graduated, I, two weeks after I graduated college, I was just sitting on my parents' couch and just kind of going like, why don't I have a job already? Why, right. <laughs> where, where is my full-time job? What, well, what, what am I going to do? Like, th this is what's supposed to happen. And very similarly to you, I, I worked full-time while in school full-time. So I'm, I'm lucky that I did not have student loan debt because I went to, you know, a state school and did everything I could to try to keep everything within what I could balance. But I graduated with an English literature degree and yeah. that job that I got a month after was as an administrative assistant. Like that was, it was exactly that pipeline. And, you know, and that eventually transformed into me doing what I went to school for. I mean, I, I went to school for literature and for marketing. So, you know, you can get, you can get there eventually. But when you thought that that was the answer, I was I was good at school, but I, I hated it. Like I can trace the the first day that I went, oh, I don't, I don't like school. I was in kindergarten when I found <laughs> out that first grade was going to be a full day. Like when they said, okay, well next year you're going to be here all day. I went, that interrupts my schedule. And, and from that <laughs> point on, it was over. So it was just kind of like, I'm going through this because that's what I have to do. That's the only way I can live a life and succeed. Right. And that really is the thing that we're taught. And I think that's something I try to push back in, in the book. And I talk about this online too. We need to stop thinking about college as the thing you do after high school, unless your family is well off enough and you have enough opportunity that you are able to go to college without it costing you any money. Because for many people, it will incur debt and it will be the second most expensive thing we spend money on in our lifetime. The first being a house, if we ever can afford it. It's more expensive than a car for most people. It is a major financial obligation. And we don't talk about it that way. And people older than us aren't telling us that. They're telling us, we'll just get the degree and you'll be fine. And what when we graduate from college, we look around and we're like, I thought everything was supposed to instantly be fine now. And it's not. And we got to eke out a living in 
whatever way we can. A lot of freelance work, a lot of low paid jobs. We're chronically underemployed. Unless again, you're in these very specific fields like engineering, medical, there are these specific things where the degree is good, but nobody tells us that nobody, nobody said comma caveat, as long as you graduate in one of these fields with a high return on investment for your college degree. Right. Did you go into the right path that will immediately pay itself off, but also it's going to take eight years to get that degree and still cost you six figures. And you'll work nonstop anyway for all that money that you make. Right. So yeah. There's there's a lot to it. Oof. I would be remiss if I didn't bring up Fresno. I actually also have a, I have a love of Fresno. So two of my friends, one of my best friends um, from high school. So I live. Shout out to Ohio, as you did in the book. That's I'm in Cleveland, and so after we graduated, somewhere in like the middle of college, they both decided they were just moving to California and Fresno was the spot that they picked because it was the closest that they could find to our weather system here. We yeah, get, we get quite hot in the summer, not 110, but we do have the humidity. So it like balances, although they definitely miss the snow, <laughs> but they also specifically lived in tower district. <gasps> wow. So when I That's would amazing. go and stay with them, I was, I was in tower. And so I have just so many fond memories and I feel like I found myself learning about Fresno with you while I was reading. I was like, wasn't the experience I have because I was with two people who were just in love with it. Yeah, no, it's true. I think now when I bring people to Fresno, people are like, this place is great. Why would you ever leave? And when I think back, I'm like, you know, no, it is great here. Why did I think I needed to leave? But I think it again has to do with how we mythologize opportunity. We have this fairy tale that life could be okay if only you did steps A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And growing up in Fresno, people were like, well, it just has to be because we're here. That has to be one of the things that's going wrong. And that must be why, you know, everybody here is broke. So it's got to be an issue with Fresno. So growing up, I really didn't appreciate how amazing it is, how community oriented it is, uh, how just a fun place to be it is back then how affordable it was now it has some of the most rapidly uh rising rents in california yeah it caught up but, yeah it did it did i though at the time just thought well you're supposed to get out of fresno that's what you're supposed to do and it wasn't until i i left and i met pe people in a lot of different places around the united states that i realized like no, this place was special and it was good and i'm angry that so many people convinced me fresno was the problem Rather than acknowledging, that, like, no, the system of capitalism that the whole country, everybody is forced to exist in. This is the issue. Everybody is encountering these same issues. And I was kind of mad when I realized I bought this lie, right? I was sold a lie and I bought it. Fresno is my problem because it really stopped me maybe from appreciating my hometown. And when I look back now, I'm like, well, maybe there is a world where I didn't feel like I needed to leave Fresno and go get this overpriced college degree to have a good life. Maybe I stayed in Fresno and I, opened a little business there and hired all my friends from my hometown. And like, I'm mad that that reality was taken from me because I was told this myth that the American dream and class mobility was possible. And if I wasn't achieving it and if people around me weren't achieving it, it's probably because they were doing it wrong. And part of doing it wrong meant staying in Fresno. That was the narrative we were told. So it is upsetting. I feel like my love of my hometown didn't come till way later. And I'm upset that that was taken from me. Absolutely. And it, it it's such, it is such a cool town. Like I, oh, I'm, I miss Fresno. Like I miss those visits. They have both since moved to other places on, on the map, but just because rent was, like you said, rapidly rising for, for the area and what they were doing and where they wanted to go next. Yeah, definitely. And there's not a lot of job opportunities there. That is one of the things that is a struggle. It is. It, and when it was a cheap place to be, it kind of balanced out. You know, there's not a lot of work, but it's a cheap place to be. But when you basically what started happening is people from San Francisco increasingly were able to work from home. So they moved to Sacramento because it was cheap for them. People from Sacramento then moved to Fresno because they were driven out of their home. So it's kind of this like two point migration system. And it did just flood Fresno with remote workers, right, who are able to have these high paying jobs. Meanwhile, people who grew up there who don't have the remote jobs from the high pay cities 
most of the options are like service work. Like you can work at like a Starbucks, you can work for an insurance company, or you can work for the IRS. That's the good job in Fresno. You work for the IRS. I, but it it makes sense. I mean, being in Ohio, Columbus specifically for us was hit with kind of the migration from LA when the pandemic hit. So there's a a huge housing situation in in the south of the state because people could work from anywhere. So they were making their California salary in a much lower cost of living town. That it's it's displaced people who you know, people in neighborhoods and others, high rise apartment complexes everywhere. And like, of course, people need places to live, but the the cost that goes with them definitely has reshaped. So we've seen we've seen changes just across the map from capitalism. I mean, you, you yeah. pointed it out perfectly with the the title, like, all we're getting is just the lousy t shirts. That's, that's that's what's right. coming. Yeah, it- the Cleveland thing's interesting because I went and visited there. I visited Cleveland and it was beautiful. I'm like, this, it's like, it's- a We good- get a lot of grief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I looked and I was like, it feels like they built a city and nobody came. And I asked a question about that on TikTok and everyone's like, that's because property developers have gone into Cleveland now, massively gentrified it, remodeled these buildings and are charging these astronomical rents that very, very few, few people can afford. So they literally did build a city hoping- to entice or rebuild rather the city, hoping to entice people from New York or California, but they just didn't come in the droves everybody expected. And meanwhile, you go to these other areas of town and the buildings are deteriorating and they're not cared for and the, they have slum lords in charge of these places and the facilities are maintained. So it is, it's like people keep bouncing around thinking where they are is the problem, not the system that the whole country's in. I don't know if I say this in the book, but something my grandfather told my aunt once always is in the back of my head. She moved around a lot. And she's always like, oh, no, this isn't the place for me. This isn't the place for me. My grandpa told her, you know, everywhere you go, there you are. And I think about this a lot. And you really do. We talk about gentrification. And obviously, gentrification is a really, really violent, terrible thing. And I think about my complicity in gentrification moving from Fresno to LA, even moving into, you know, my grandmother's originally from here, from one neighborhood over from where I live now. But even that, I'm like, well, you know, my presence here can still be violent. And when we think about it, everywhere we go, there we are. That really is the best way to summarize people hoping to flee what they view as this, like, economic restraint around them placed it by capitalism. And they do, they think like, well, if I just move somewhere else, it'll be easier. It'll be easier. It'll be easier. But if you're just bouncing around from place to place in the United States, we're all, we're all dealing with the ramifications of capitalism in different ways. You're trading one set of problems for another. And it, at what point are people going to realize it's not where you are, it's policy decisions. And we need a massive overhaul of our policy here. Right. At this point, something has to be done because we're just going to be there. It's the same problems, different city. Your grandpa was right. Like without a doubt, it's, it's there. The, the impact of our society on us, but also then how we may be dealing with our own grief or our own part in that, no matter how you look at it, you're still running from yourself. If you're, if you're running from something. Right. I am a lover of a spray paint thrift. And so your, your stories of your mom, just kind of taking things and painting them metallic colors, the amount of things in my house that I have spray painted, just metallic, silver, copper, whatever I can get my hands on. Do you have a favorite project that you've created over the years? I do. I I instantly know what it is. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Okay. So yeah, we used to do this thing where we would find old furniture on the street and we'd bring it home and we would just paint it. And I had this thing uh, in my bedroom in high school that I just called pink. Like it was its name. Its name was pink and it was a piece of furniture. And it had been like an old media console, like back in the days when TVs were really, really dense and like deep and huge. You have these massive media consoles, like these giant pieces of furniture that they would sit in. And it'd be really solid wood, like nicely constructed because those TVs were so heavy. It had to go in something massive. Then also there would be shelves to store like your VHS tapes, you know, your VCR. So it'd be like almost like an armoire, but just for your media, like a media cabinet. So my stepdad and I found one of these on the street and he helped me carry it home and we sanded it down together and I painted it bubble gum, high gloss pink. So it was bubble gum, pink, super, super shiny and glossy painted everything. Then I hot glued bright blue faux fur on the top of it and every single drawer and shelf I lined in checkerboard contact paper. And I used this to store my clothes in my bedroom in high school. 
this, this thing I called pink, this monstrous creature in my room. And I loved this thing so much. And I still, I still do this. I will still find furniture on the side of the road, you know, or Mm -hmm. I just found this like, ikea shelf and i was like oh this thing doesn't look special but what if we spray painted it green a couple months ago and (laughs) my boyfriend and i went to home depot got a can of green spray paint spray painted it in the front of the house and i love it i'm looking at it now it's it's so so cute so yeah i think that's like i don't know that's the more fun element of reusing what's already there and i've seen people talk about this online like oh poor people were the original like sustainable eco-conscious queens <laughs> absolutely true. the original diy girlies the original let's reduce waste because we found it on the side of the road i love it there's nothing better than going well i kind of hate that but it's five dollars and if i made it a different color great who knows yeah exactly my favorite app right now is freebie alerts do you know about this app no oh my god i'm obsessed with this app so this app is an aggregate app and it draws from different places online where people are getting rid of stuff so it does everything except for free craigslist so i go on free craigslist and then i go on freebie apps and you can just see anything you want where people are like yeah just come get it from my house today it's kind of big i don't need it anymore and i don't know what to do with it and this a is a new obsession. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> so great. So anytime I need something for my house, I'm always like, well, I'm just going to check freebie apps first. I'm just going to check freebie alerts and see if it's on there because then you don't have to buy something brand new. It's already there. And it's so, so fun. And I don't know. I'm just like obsessed with this app. It's, it's also just like satisfying. I always get the itch in my brain of like, I need to create something, but I only want to work like a certain amount. It depends on am I remodeling a room in the house or do I just need like a new piece of furniture to spray paint? And I, I love the outlet of how quick and how easy I'm now hitting the point where it's like, Oh, someone doesn't want this garden gnome anymore. I guess I have a hot pink garden gnome in my front yard now because it can't just be normal. (laughs) No, I love that. That's the best. Um, I do this like not just with objects too. I also do this with food. I'm like notorious for this. So my friend started dating someone new and uh, I was like watching him throughout the day and I kind of like roasted him. I was like, so what are we on like a thousand dollar a day food budget or what? Do you work for Google? How are you pulling this off my guy? And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, dude, we've hung out for like six hours and I've seen you spend like $400 on snacks. Like not to shame you, but it's almost impressive at this point. And he's like, well, how much do you spend on food? And I'm like, I spend $150 a month on my grocery budget. And he was like, what? How do you, how do you do that? And I'm like, I don't know. I just do. So we go out to dinner and he orders like, I, I, okay. I respect this because I do this too. He's like, well, I want to try everything. So I'm going to get four different things. And I'm like, okay, I love this for you. Yes. But then he takes three of them and he's like, no one bite. And he's like, uh, uh-uh, I'm done. So then the waitress comes and was like, oh, okay. Do you want like a box for these items? And he's like, no, no, no. And I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I will take like, them home. <laughs> I will take them home. So he's like, you're really going to take my leftovers home? And I'm like, 100%. Yes. And he's like, this is how you spend $150 a month on food. You're like a little food scavenger. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to let it go to waste if it's here. So I'm obsessed with this. So along with freebie alerts, if you also are a person who doesn't want food to ever go to waste, uh, there's too good to go. Do you know about this app? Do they have it? No, in I, I'll have to look. Oh, it's so great. So it's restaurants where they have food that they're about to throw out and you can sign up and be like, yeah, I'll come by at 5 p.m. today and pick up a bag of random food you're about to throw out. And it's usually like three to seven dollars. Wow. And it's totally random what you get. But like one of my friends is like, yeah, I got like a 40 pound bag of rice from that once. And I've been living off it for like a year. You can get um, one time I went to my favorite vegan bakery is vegan gluten-free bakery. Very fancy. And for $5, I got a giant bag of miniature cupcakes, but all of them were inexplicably smashed. So I literally just ate these smashed cupcakes for like four days straight. I'm surprised <laughs> they didn't like, turn them into like cake pops or something. But Oh, yeah. No, there's like, oh, it's just a bag of smashed food. Take getting it. I'm rid like, of them. Yeah, I will. I will take this very much. I will eat this. But yeah, I'm anyway. good to go. I'm getting I, I will be getting into that because everybody should. It's amazing. But I think that is interesting where you're like, you have all these people talking about sustainability and it's like really just being broke is the easiest way to be sustainable because we're just like, I'll take that. I'll use that. Oh, you're not using that. I'll, I'll come on, bring it on over here. I'll make use of everything. Exactly. It's, I feel like every time I'm getting rid of something, it's the the text chain that goes out of like, okay, does anyone need this couch? It's not too broken down. Like you don't even need to put a board in it yet. Like it's just the, like, <laughs> Wait, it's I'm just so the sorry. layout. 
I'm just now learning that the board and the couch is a thing because there is a wood board <laughs> in my used couch right now because it got too saggy. I didn't realize this was a thing everybody was doing. <laughs> When I mean, couches are expensive and they always have been. I mean, there are some cheap ones out there, but that is one of those where you're like, you get what you pay for. You might be better off putting a board in the bottom of one. Yeah. I mean, I have done the old throw an old futon over it and like put a nice blanket over it. So you're not really noticing that there's a futon on it too. But yeah, you, you got to go through the line of like, this is in pretty good shape, but I found another used couch in better shape. So I want to switch to this one. Like, you, you have to spread it around. And I think that goes to your message in the book about found family. I mean, not to quote you to you, I know how painful that is, but we're not a cult. We look out for each other. We're what a family should be. And I wanted to ask you, what about found family stands out as so important to you? And how do you spread that beyond kind of the people in your circle? I think like I have maybe, uh, I have an interesting relationship with found family. Um, I, you know, grew up bisexual. Everybody I knew was gay or queer. And for a lot of people I knew found family was a necessity because their families were not accepting of them being gay or queer. For me, uh, it was interesting because my, my family was always very, very accepting. It was very normal in my family for people to be gay. It was a non-issue. Everybody just kind of assumed everybody was gay. There's a story I don't include, but it's just actually really charming where one of my family members tried to throw a coming out party for me where they were like, well, Maddie's a lesbian. And by saying that she's bisexual, you know, we've accidentally pigeonholed her into this thing where she can't just admit that she's a lesbian. So we need to really come full force and be there for her. So they throw this whole like, congrats, you're a lesbian party and for me. And I'm like, oh, this is like really sweet, but I am actually bisexual. <laughs> you know, you were, it was fine. So it's like the levels, the like queer acceptance in my family was all always very there and on issue. But, you know, my mother and I had a difficult relationship for other reasons. We just butt heads a lot. And, you know, we, I struggled to live in her house for a number of reasons. And that's the reason that found family became important to me because, uh, you know, I felt very independent. I took care of myself and I'm very glad that both my mother and my father raised me in a way that taught me to be like that consciously and intentionally, but also it was very hard being a teenager and feeling like you couldn't rely on any adults in the room. Maybe yeah. you look in the mirror and you're 14 and you're like, oh no, am I the adult in the room? I don't feel ready <laughs> to be the adult in the room. So that is why to me, you know, having a strong peer group became very, very important because it was someone I could rely on, people I knew would show up if I needed help. And for a lot of that peer group, they were queer people as well, but mm -hmm. it was important to them for different reasons. They didn't have a family to rely on. And we even had friends in our group where, you know, they weren't queer, but they had very religious parents, very religious families. And we all did kind of have this look out for each other mindset, but I think that it felt more normal to us because of the way that Fresno and the Tower District in particular operated. It was very community oriented already. And I think that that helped kind of normalize it for us in a lot of ways. So I think that the idea of found family is really important to people coming, coming to it from a lot of different perspectives, because like you cannot choose your family. And uh, you know, a lot of people tell you, you got to love your family no matter what. And you look at people and you hear about their lives and you go, I don't know. I don't think you have to love that person no matter what. You you don't have to. And what, it just becomes very, very important to remember that there are people around you who do care about you, who you can trust, who you can count on to have your back, that you don't have to be the 14-year-old in the room going, oh man, am I an adult now? I'm the parent. <laughs> I'm the parent. Yeah. You can be the parent friend, maybe. You can be right. like, okay, we're at the rave. You're rolling. I brought a granola bar. Like That should be the extent of the expectation when you're young, right? right. For you to have any sort of parental ability. And I, I don't know. I just, I think it is really beautiful when we build communities we can rely on and as I got older, one of the things I miss actually, no matter where I moved, I never had quite the community that I did in Fresno. And I missed it a lot as I went other places. Um, but, you know, now I would say that I still, I have a little group of people that I do things with. And this is, these I, you know, I say these are the people who are stuck with me forever. My best friend, I'm like, you're stuck with me. You're stuck with me forever. You know, yep. she gets a boyfriend. I'm like, what's our new boyfriend like? You know? <laughs> Does he meet our standards? Are we okay with him? Is he ready to join the commune? Because we know 
the, we own a plot of land with two houses on it. And I love it. You know, she's got one house. I've got the other. It's like we do these things as as a group. And I don't Does he know what he's signed up for because <laughs> there's the door, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it does. It feels good to know that you're not in it alone, I guess. And that if you're born into a family where you you don't feel like you can be yourself or you don't feel like you can trust people to have your back, um, that you have options beyond that. And, you know, I, I have a, like I said, I have like kind of a unique position on it because I am very close with my dad. I love my dad very, very much. But one of the things I realized young is that because my dad was so young when he had me and because he was effectively a single parent in my youngest years, by the time I got kind of self-sufficient, he was like, okay, you good? I'm going to go try to live the rest of my twenties now. Like I'm going to try or my thirties, you know, he's like, I'm going to try to have a little fun now as long as you're good. And it was cool to be able to look at my dad and be like, you know what? I got this. I'm good. Go live the rest of your life. Now you put so much of it on pause to be a parent for me. And that's so amazing. And now you can go, you know, have the youth you didn't get to have for the sake of me. And I think that's something I was only able to do. Yeah. Because I found community in other ways. And I'm also just still struck with the image of y'all sitting in the house on your 90s clear plastic (laughs) furniture (laughs) and you going, I don't think you can afford me right now and and kind of making those decisions together. But but right, being able to give kind of give and take in that relationship. And I think that really speaks to just so much of of your life and of your experience. Yeah. And I think that that all comes from my dad. My dad was a great parent for a lot of reasons. But one of the cool things he did is he always treated everything like we were a team. So it's like, okay, we're getting ready to get you to school. What do you need to do to make it happen? What do I need to do to make it happen? Or, you know, we're cooking dinner or we're doing this. And it was very like us together. And I always felt like my dad had my back and we were on the same page. So, you know, when he hit a financial rough period and there was a moment, yes, where the furniture was gone and we were sitting on the inflatable furniture from my bedroom. And I, I was able to look at him and say, you know, okay, I get it. We're a team and you can't afford this right now. And that's okay. I care about you and you care about me. And we got to change some things around to make life tenable, I guess. You right. Know? right. Yeah. But that all, co- all comes from him as well. And and that's beautiful. It's It's really lovely to see those moments and to to have you share that with the world and just be like everyone's situation is different and everyone's situation is beautiful in the ways that they make it beautiful what is one fashion trend you love and one you're excited to see returning Hmm. okay so i think that one fashion trend i have always really really loved is anything that's kind of upcycled or changed and i think this like goes back to my childhood there was this period where we went from having like pegged jeans were really popular in the late 80s and the early 90s. And then flares got to be really, really popular. And I remember, you know, everybody would go to the fabric store, you know, get some fabric, and then they'd go home and they'd split up the sides of their peg leg jeans that weren't in fashion anymore. And then they would sew in these triangle strips to make them into bell bottoms. And this was like the coolest thing you could do with your jeans. And you knew, you knew everybody was doing this at home themselves. And it was just so cool to watch it happen though. And everybody chose different strips of fabric. And I just have fond memories of this. This was like, again, my mother and I have a difficult relationship, but this is something she and I did together when I was a kid. And it it stands out as a really happy memory in my mind. And I think that people now are maybe starting to realize that the sustainability pushed by capitalism is a myth or a lie in a lot of ways that we're being told like, no, if you just buy this fiber, if you just do it this way, it's going to be so, so good for the planet. And I think people are starting to realize like, I think the best thing I could do for the planet is reuse what's already there. Yep. (laughs) So seeing a lot of people get into DIY, get into reworking things uh, has been one of my favorite things. I think there's been a huge emphasis on personal style again, going back to a time where it's like, no, let your freak flag fly, like do things your way. Don't, you don't have to be like the Zara every four weeks is a new fashion trend kind of person. And so I think we do see like this return to what can you do with it? Um, There's like a girl on TikTok who makes outfits out of keyboards. And I'm like, that is so cool. Like, yes, why not super glue a keyboard to the front of you and wear it like a shirt? Like you should do that. And I think like we are really fostering in different corners of the internet, especially a return to that kind of creativity and doing things in a unique way and doing things yourself. And I just think that that is really cool. That's always going to be my favorite 
trend and it comes and goes. Sometimes it's considered like D-class A or tacky to look like you made your own outfit at home with a glue gun and a sewing machine. But I think right now people have kind of this new appreciation for it once again. And I, I'm so excited to see it because it means people get so much more creative. And I think it crosses over with like the return of rave culture. In mm -hmm. the past five years, rave culture has been hitting really hard. And we're seeing um, not just the mainstream raves, like the underground raves, like they used to be in the 90s when we used to go to raves. Right, you know? it's all coming back. <laughs> it's all coming back. And you see people really like going all out for these unique outfits and wanting to do something different. And I just think that's really special and cool. It's, it is really fun to see the, the acceptance of like having your own style. It's, it's no longer like there's the one friend who has the, the unique style and everyone was like, well, she's got the unique style and it's looked down on. And now it's like, everyone is a cottage core swamp witch with their fashion. And I'm here for it. I mean, Me too. I want to make sure I give a second to say, you have a podcast, Pick Me Up, I'm Scared. Uh, yes. What can folks expect there? Because I want to give every plug opportunity possible. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, yes. Yeah. So Pick Me Up, I'm Scared is my podcast uh, where people have jokingly said, I just info dump at one of my friends for a few hours about something I think is really interesting. Um which I think actually is a fair description. So I will have different friends be co-hosts. Uh, right now, my friend David, who is my oldest friend, known me since I was a sophomore in high school. I talk about him in the book a lot, actually. He is the, the podcast co-host at the moment. And recent topics uh, have included Henry Kissinger. When he died, we did a deep dive on Henry Kissinger. Um, we are coming up on an episode about PETA which I think will be really interesting. I've been vegan for 12 years, so we're going to do a PETA deep dive. There's a lot of political stuff. There's some social stuff. We did one episode about libraries, for example. Love it. <laughs> I think my listeners might like that. <laughs> yes. It was kind of a, it's, it was a heartbreaking episode because it, in the end, not to spoil too much or give too much away, it was one of those things where you're like, I love the concept of a library, but it too has been adversely affected by a lot of the issues that we see replicated throughout society here in the United States. It's dealt with some of the same issues of racism and power and class. And so, yeah, we take these kind of topics and we do a deep dive on them and we try to uh, view them through the lens of capitalism as well as much as we can. And we try to be sympathetic. Uh, I did an episode about parenting, actually, and everyone was like, this is remarkably sympathetic, given how, how critical I can be about my mother sometimes. <laughs> like, you know, she did the best she could. They're all, all the parents are doing the best they can, and some people are doing better than others. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> There's like baseline of like, let's not go below this, but anything yes. else, you're doing the best you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As long as you're actively harming your child. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the baseline. <laughs> that's the baseline. <laughs> and then, but we get into some like, some of the more unique forms of parenting, for example, like free range parenting. What is that? What's up with that? How's that going for people? Let's check in on the free range parenting. And we're like, well, you know, try to give a fair analysis of it. So that's the podcast. It's just see me. a deep dive in my future because, wow, <laughs> I'm yeah. only thinking free range eggs. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We are the eggs. We are the eggs. Oh. I know. It's kind of cute, right? I've been told that my dad was maybe the original free range parenter. So, who knows? You'll have to listen to the episode. I can see, see that. that. So, I'm but... definitely going to be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to some quick, rapid fire questions from a nosy podcaster. Is there anything you're reading or listening to right now? Um, I am reading, what is this book over here? Oh, okay. No, I can't even read the edge of the book. My, my friend, David gives me all these books I'm supposed to read. It's like homework. And I'm like, I can't even freaking see that one right now. Um, okay. One book I am almost done with though, that I do like is all about Marina Lita, Spain, which is a tiny, uh, communist utopia village in Spain. And it's very, very small though. And a lot of people haven't heard of it. So that's a great book that I'm working through. Love it. Uh, when I say public library, what comes to mind? Uh, power washers. N not a lot of people would think that, but we recently rented a power washer from our public library to power wash the outside of our house. It, it was really cool. What won't the libraries provide? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Power washer. They had so many power tools. They also have like full jewelry making kits you can rent. You can check out a kit to make your own jewelry from the LA, I believe, county. I get the county and city confused, so don't come for me. You can rent like anything from the library. It's really amazing. When you go to a restaurant, what is the item on the menu that you judge the place by? Like what's your go-to? What's the like, if they do this well, I can eat something else here? 
Okay, it's a vegan chili relleno. Okay, yep, that's mm-hmm. that's a very good judge. Yes. What project that you can talk about, of course, are you working on right now? Ooh, um, what project am I working on right now? God, that one's actually really hard. Um, I feel like wrapping up the book, the next thing we're going into is the book tour. So that's kind of where my mind has been right now, book tour land. Uh, so after book tour land, I'll actually be excited to not have too many projects on my plate. And by that, I mean, just doing the podcast, obviously, and my normal job at Tunnel Vision. So we're looking forward to trying to make some big changes at work going into the next year. And that's going to be fun and exciting. So really just... Uh, getting control of my little day to day because writing the book has been great, but it has been a big thing on top of working my normal oh so strenuous and hard 28 hour a week job. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, work is work. Uh, It's it all gets done no matter how much time you spend on it. So um, how long did you work on the book? The book took me around a year to write, and I'm told that actually was pretty fast, especially given the fact that I was working my normal job and doing the podcast at the same time. yeah, it. I actually overwrote. I wrote too too much. It turns out I wrote way too much. We had to cut about uh, a lot out. But yeah, it did take around a year. And I think honestly, it was harder to write this book than it would have been for me to write something else, because I just could not get it in my head that there was anything interesting about my life for a really long time. So I'm like, how do I even tell this story? And I feel like a lot of the stories you tell when you're writing about yourself, you can't write well. You're just like, here's what happened. And then this guy came up and then this thing happened. And then she said this, and it just felt very forced to me. So it was hard for me to get into the writing groove with it, I think. Your your writing is brilliant. And do you plan to write more in the future? I would love to write more in the future. My goal is to write a sci-fi utopia novel. <sighs> So, I could see that. I could see you've already got the utopia base knowledge to work off of. Oh, uh, yes, please <laughs> let me know when that's coming. I will I, would I will be there. That. They also, the people, not like the people, not my publishers or anything like that, but the people who follow me have been requesting like a budget cookbook because I spend so little on food all the time. Right. I'm now I'm back to 150 a month. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. So everyone's like, would you ever make a cookbook? Because um everybody by this point probably knows I uh I have like a wheat allergy and I'm vegan and a lot of people are like well it's really expensive to eat that way and I'm like no 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 I know like all the tricks you just make these giant bowls of mush but they're all delicious I swear <laughs> everyone's like okay then make a cookbook I relate to mush we call it slop over here it's just the the like quick dump like everything in the pot but delicious and comforting yes with <laughs> rice is the base you get the rice mm-hmm. and then you just pour all the stuff on top it's delicious we we don't have wheat and gluten issues so we'll um do uh crescent rolls on top of it so it's like it gets really crusty I know Sorry. Oh, so good. It's so oh, good. Sounds delicious. Wow. I don't know yeah. if there's like a, a way to do that gluten free or wheat free, but uh. there probably is. There probably is. Yeah. I saw this woman actually on TikTok. She went viral for making this like giant one pot casserole. And all these people on Twitter were like, this is the woman that like, when the apocalypse happens, she's going to be her. things. She's just like, here's how you do it. You throw all this stuff in here. Don't worry about measuring. It's going to come out great. And I'm like, that is my approach to cooking. Whatever this woman is doing, this is my goal. Yeah. Well, yeah. So we'll be looking forward to that cookbook because I think we all need cheap and easy. Yes. And then last, is there anything else you'd like listeners to take away from your book? I think the thing that I... <sighs> The thing that I would want people to know is that the world is really, really, really hard. There is not a perfect way to live in it. There is not a perfect way to do things. Uh, There aren't a series of magic steps you can take to be a good person, to be a rich person. There's just all of us fumbling through life, doing our best with what we have. And, you know, as long as you do your best every single day to try to be kind to the people around you who deserve it, uh, to stand up for what you think is right in the world and to not let others push each other around. And as long as you are doing a little bit every single day to make the most of whatever situation you are in, that's all anybody can expect from you. There's it's anybody who tells you that there is a simple, perfect way for your life to fall into place is probably trying to sell you something and it's never going to be easy. I think it is just hard and messy and difficult. Um, but I think that you know, if you read my book, what I would hope that you would come out of it understanding is that 
There are little things you can do to hopefully maximize your enjoyment of the time you do have here. Uh, recognize that some things are systemic and that they require systemic overhaul and you yourself are not capable of doing that alone, but together we can. That I think is the biggest takeaway. So be kind to yourself and uh, you're not, don't expect perfection and just do what you can and try to get through every day. Such a meaningful way to kind of wrap and reflect. Um, one last thing, of course, because I said it, that was the last thing and it's not, uh, where can the listeners find you online? I can be found on TikTok. TikTok, uh, my at is at Madeline Pendleton, Pendleton like the wool company. And I can also be found on Instagram at Madeline Pendleton as well. And my podcast is Pick Me Up, I'm Scared, and it can be found on Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. Awesome. Well, Madeline, thank you so much for being here and chatting with me. Thank you so much. This was so fun and easy and awesome and cool. That's all I could ever dream to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Listeners, make sure you pick up I Survived Capitalism and All I Got Was This Lousy T-Shirt on January 16th and follow Madeline on social media. As always, happy reading. Readers can sample and borrow the titles mentioned in today's episode on Overdrive.com or in Libby. Our library friends can purchase these titles in Marketplace. Professional Book Nerds is proud to be an Evergreen Podcast signature program. To learn about other Evergreen Podcasts, visit evergreenpodcasts.com. Our podcast is produced, recorded, and edited by Emma Dwyer and Joe Skelly and presented by Overdrive. To learn more, visit professionalbooknerds.com. 